the vast majority of Negroes still feel that the best way to deal with the dilemma that we face in this country is uh, through nonviolent resistance. And uh, I don't think this vocal group will be able uh, to make a real dent in the Negro community in terms of swaying 22 million Negroes to this particular point of view. And I contend that the cry of black power is at bottom a reaction to the reluctance of white power to make the kind of changes necessary to make justice a reality for the Negro. I think we've got to see that a riot is the language of the unheard. And what is it that America has failed to hear? It has failed to hear that the economic plight of the Negro poor has worsened over the last few years. How many summers like this one do you imagine that we can expect? Well, I would say this, we don't have long. The mood of the Negro community now is one of urgency, one of saying that we aren't going to wait, that we've got to have our freedom. We've waited too long. So that uh, I would say that every summer we are going to have this kind of vigorous protest. My hope is that it will be nonviolent. I would hope that we can avoid riots because riots are self-defeating and socially destructive. I would hope that we can avoid riots, but that we will be as militant and as determined next summer and through the winter uh, as we have been this summer. And I think the answer about how long it will take will depend on the federal government, on the city halls of our various cities, and on white America to a large extent. This is where we are at this point, and I think white America will determine how long it will be and which way we go in the future. Welcome to the Networking with Michelle podcast, the show dedicated to providing you with life strategies with a little bit of entrepreneur advice. Here we believe in the Jim Rohn quote, success is nothing more than a few simple disciplines practiced every day. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Networking with Michelle show. I'm your host, Michelle Gomez. Welcome to episode two, Perspective of Black Lives. And you just heard a clip from Martin Luther King Jr. on September 27th, 1966. He did an interview with Mike Wallace from 60 Minutes. And that is where we are hearing and seeing the popular quote, a riot is the language of the unheard. So this is a four and a half minute interview on the 60 Minutes YouTube channel. I will have that link if you want to listen to the full conversation. Um, but once again, a uh, uh, timely <laughs> timely quote, timely interview, timely conversation. And I mean, me personally, I just can't get enough of this. And it's relevant. It's fitting. And I think it goes great with the conversation I'm having today with Brandon Jones. If you listen to perspective of Black Lives four years ago on uh, regarding the Philando Castile shooting that happened in Minneapolis. I was fortunate to have Brandon on my show during that time, so it is no coincidence that <laughs> he's on here now. And um, I did a throwback Thursday um, playing or promoting his episode on social media. And even when I posted it, I was like, man, like we should run it back. We should like do another interview. And I was looking at my schedule and I was like, man, my schedule is just too crazy. And, um, but it was lingering on it, lingering on me. And then he suggested it. I was like, man, let's go. That's, that's confirmation. You know how I wrote, if two people say something, it's worth looking into. So I'm glad we're on the same page. Uh, great conversation. Uh, we talk about the state of the city, you know, um, everything that's what's going on with the the, the difference between the protesting and the looting Target, because Target is headquartered there, uh, which is something that really crossed my mind. Um, a lot of young black professionals um, start off with great careers in Minnesota. Uh, so probably doesn't sound like the ideal place if you're in the South and like warm weather, but um, it is definitely some things that I was thinking about when all of this was going on. So we discussed that. Uh, we talk about the male role and the family unit within the Black Lives Matter movement, which I think is so important. 
Uh, we talk about just a lot of things, you know, economics, education, politics. And the thing is, uh, how do we get through the struggle? You know, how do we get through the struggle? I think this is going to be a great leading conversation, uh, better than my rant. <laughs> so without further ado, let's go to Brandon Jones. Hey everyone, welcome to the Networking with Michelle show. Today's special guest is Brandon Jones. He's been here before, maybe a couple of times. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's been a while though, it's been a while. So it's always good to have a familiar face, a familiar voice. So Brandon, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Um, it's always a pleasure to come on platforms such as yours. Uh, I'm maintaining as best as possible and continuing to be a support in the community um, from a mental health, mental and emotional health standpoint. Uh, so for folks, I'm a psychotherapist. I'm also a professor. Um, and then I also work at a nonprofit organization where I manage programs here in the Twin Cities. So all the events that went down, um, you know, people seen the police precinct come down, they seen Target and AutoZone and the liquor stores and everything and the looting taking place right smack dab in the middle of it happening in the neighborhoods that I frequent and I'm a part of every day. Yeah, um, there's just so many questions uh, centered around that. I guess I'm curious, when it comes to the looting, of, um, we see the images on social media and on national TV. Yeah. Um, how does the local media focus, I guess, determine the difference between the protesters and looting? Because yeah. There's a lot of white images that tend to circulate. Absolutely. Well, the local media here doesn't do a good job differentiating between what I say there's three levels, right? Mm -hmm. So you have protesting, you have rioting, and then you have looting. Those are three different types of actions that can take place uh, during situations like this. And the way that the local media has been talking about it is it all is kind of the same thing. And everybody and all the people who are doing those things are all together. And that's not true. Um, and if you were someone who was paying attention to some of the live streams that were going on, you see what was happening. The protesting was typically happening during the daytime um, <clears throat> when the lights are on. Or the sun's out, really. Um, and people are actually peacefully protesting. You know, they may have their signs. They may be saying things. Things are happening. But those large crowds were typically people that were peacefully protesting. What really went down with the rioting, that did start shortly after um, on Wednesday. Wednesday was the day that that kind of started for us. Tuesday was the day of everything was protesting. And then Wednesday, the looting started with Target being kind of the first store that got broken into. And then people started, you know, getting things out. So the looting started early. The rioting started late at night. So the rioting was, all right, we're going to occupy these areas. They have looting and rioting going on at the same time. Now, rioting is just unrest. You know, you're burning fires. You may be throwing things at whoever or things may be getting hit. On, you know, you might be getting hit with stuff, depending on what end of the spectrum you're on. But the looting became a huge phenomenon Wednesday night going into Thursday and then Thursday night and Friday night and then Saturday. So we had several days of looting and then it spread. It started in South Minneapolis. Again, started with Target and there's, there's a shopping center where that Target is. It started there and then there was the auto zone that's close to that area. It's literally right across the street. That was the first thing to really get set ablaze and then everything else just kind of took fire after that. Then they started looting up and down what we call Lake Street, which is one of the primary streets in South Minneapolis, all the way down Lake Street. <laughs> like literally, it's probably about a mile and a half away, if not even longer, even to our uptown area, uh, where a lot there's like a lot of bars and it's like a it's kind of like an artistic scene in uptown, um, a lot of high-end shops, things like that. That that even started to get looted as well. So the looting just kind of spread. The arson and the the actual fires that just took off and then buildings started burning in St. Paul over north Minneapolis, and it just kind of you know took over from there. So the way the media has looked at it is all the people who are doing the protesting, the looting, the rioting, they're all the same, but that wasn't true. And and the governor has had to come out since uh, both mayors of St. Paul and Minneapolis had to come out. And even the person who's over our uh, National Guard, our local National Guard chapter, they had to come out and say that there was a lot of provocateurs and a lot of white supremacists who were actually the folks who were starting these fires. So... Okay, I'm glad that's known, I guess more so on the local level, because um, even the other day on Friday, I think there was an Amazon building that burned down in yep. California or something. Yep, mm -hmm. and I big remember, warehouse. 
scrolling, yeah, scrolling through the news feed. And I was like, man, I hope this is not a BLM thing. I hope this is not a backlash. Like, we don't need this backlash right. um, to come on to us when it comes to these um, very violent, negative actions um, as we right. can protest and put the movement forward. Yeah, and typically black folks don't burn stuff down. That's not that's not typical cultural behavior from us anyway. We're not likely to burn something down. Now, we'll loot because we were definitely going into stores and getting stuff, absolutely. But everybody was looting. Somali folks, Latinos or Latinx folks, white folks were shopping, looting. I mean, they were taking their time. I mean, I, I'm not joking. I, I probably watched maybe about 20 different live streams of people who are actually a part, a part of the looting and stuff. And you just see everybody getting stuff. So it wasn't like it was black folks going into businesses, even though the narrative is saying that. But that's not what happened. Everybody took an opportunity. Everybody took that opportunity to go get what you wanted to get. The arson, now there's a lot of conspiracy theories and things where people are like, look, we seen some people who were just dressed in military type st- stuff on and they started those fires. And a lot of those fires were very suspicious. There were, especially on that Thursday and Friday here locally, um, there were businesses that they had already boarded up and said, you know, minority owned or black owned. Mm-hmm. So those were like sanctioned off to not be touched. And a lot of those businesses still had damage to them, if not fire started on them. And a lot of the people of color, the black folks, the, you know, the natives that live here in the Twin Cities and the Latino folks were saying, why were these business hit when we've already marked them as, you know, not to be targeted, but they ended up were. And there was, a, and even in North Minneapolis, especially where a lot of black folks live, there was a lot of businesses that are historically known in the neighborhood that went up in flames. And people were just like, this is really suspicious. Yeah. So yeah, the narratives are all over the place. And Target is headquartered there. Yeah, we, we, we are the, uh, we are the founding state of Target. Um, and that target, that target that was hit, that was looted over South, that's not one of the better performing targets, but okay. they protect, I don't know if people know this, but in St. Paul, we have the number one target in the United States is in St. Paul, Minnesota, it's the capital. And the reason for that is it's centered for multiple different universities and it's right in a residential neighborhood. Mm-hmm. So you can go from any downtown to get to this big, massive target. Um, you, and you can go to, there's like four or five different universities where students go to that target. And they protected that target. That target was, they had cops out there blocking it. They weren't going to let that one go up in flames. But yeah, target is based here. um, And and it's a huge scar for them to have their business be one of the highlights for the looting. Yeah. 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 And I I know um, I've come across a lot of black marketers that work for target. um, And I know um, it's a good, it's a, I know a lot of people that have started the careers um, at Target yep. um, among, you know, young black professionals. So. Absolutely. My wife. Oh. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> My wife was an HR manager for Target for about four or five years before she decided to stay home. Wow. Yeah. Um, so I know you've been helping out with the rebuild, and I'm, I'm very curious because we were talking just, I want to say, four years ago with Philando Castile. Yeah. incident happened. I don't recall any protesting or anything of this magnitude. Correct me if I'm wrong. But um, how do you feel? How is the community going? I feel like y'all just rebuilt four years ago and <laughs> here y'all go again. Yeah. So what is that like? Yeah. This is a different level of rebuild. Uh, unfortunately, with Philando, um, it wasn't, it, there were protests. Absolutely. There were a lot of protests. It was a lot of uh, underground grassroots organizing to get legislations and things changed and get policing uh, practices changed. And some of that was effective. Uh, But like many things over time, those things die down because the push isn't there because the emotional charge isn't there anymore. But what ended up happening with this, you know, with Floyd is all those same emotions and all that progress that we thought we made, just, we just got slapped in the face again. And then people are pissed. People don't want to deal with that type of stuff. And what ended up happening is you started to see an uprise. Even the even the white folks who are down for the cause, quote unquote, they're like, look, man, like we can't keep dealing with this every day. And that's why you got the overwhelming response. Now, the thing that was surprising was the national response that took place. And then the, the international, you got world you got countries who are responding to Floyd. That was something I don't think that locally we expected to happen. We, I mean, we became, you know, ground zero for a revolution that we didn't expect. And it just enhan- it, it just enhanced it even more. But one of the most beautiful things that have come from this so far is the grassroots organizing on a community level. Right now, we don't have massive nonprofits or foundations or corporations 
running what's going on with this cleanup effort. It's been people who are on the ground, who care about their communities, who just got on Facebook, got on Twitter, got on Instagram and start organizing. And the community came together. And I've never seen anything like this since the civil rights movement of community coming together to make a change and not having all these outside forces. The things that we're start- that we've started to see since then, all these, you know, Ubers and Lyfts and Chipotle and all these corporations, you know, they're blacking out on Tuesdays and they're talking about they're going to support the cause. We didn't need any of that because we did what we needed to do to take care of our community here locally. And, and I'm, I'm very proud of that. Um, I wasn't one of the lead organizers. I just come in and I just help. But the folks who did that, I take my hat off to them because that's what we need. In order for change to come, it's got to come from within. And people stepped up. They collected diapers and food and toilet paper and, um, you know, even protective gear because we're still dealing with COVID-19. Like people got together. They cleaned up the community. Like literally, it was like riot on Thursday, Friday morning cleanup, riot on Friday, Saturday morning cleanup, riot on Saturday, Sunday morning cleanup. And that was the pattern, but we understood. It wasn't blaming the people who were rioting and looting. It was saying, we understand the frustration, but this is still our community. We got to take care of each other. That rebuilding effort has to maintain for our communities to come back even at better strength than they were before, because I don't think a lot of these businesses are going to be coming back. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the unfortunate thing. Um, and there's so many ways to look at it. I know so many businesses have made um, national attention and have raised a lot of money to rebuild. Mm-hmm. So I definitely wish them the best of luck in that process. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just hard. It's just so hard for the black business owner to begin with. Absolutely. Um, I don't know. It's, it's, I don't it's know. Tough. It's, yeah. I, I, I think we talked about that the last time I was on your show. We was talking about, you know, be entrepreneurship and how it impacts your mental health. And then talking about how, you know, how as black entrepreneurs is even more difficult because we struggle just to get funding for things. We might have genius ideas. We're trying to make sure they don't get taken from us. Um, and then we want to get funding for them and it makes it hard. And it's just this like runaround that we have to do. And we have to have all these mental gymnastics just to be business people. And I think the same element is there for business owners. Even if it's something small like a cell phone shop or you might have a T-shirt printing company or whatever, it's still hard. It's still very hard. Um, and we and the thing that's, that makes this very fascinating is we're still, we're not, we haven't overcome COVID-19 yet. So remember, a lot of these businesses were closed or they were running at like 25% occupancy and this is like all types of crazy stuff. And if you're somebody who has an ice cream shop or a coffee shop, you've been closed. And then now you're, you know, the building next door to you got burned down and you might have had some damage. What are you supposed to do, right? You might have to just close shop altogether. Yeah. And, and this, I mean, we... We don't know what the ramifications from the protesting will be just yet. I think we're we're just we're just cleaning up. We're still trying to <laughs> we're still trying to get stuff off the ground for the most part to understand what is really going to be the ramifications for this. Plus, we're still not done with COVID nineteen. Right. So. Right. I know you mentioned um, you know going back four years ago there were some protests and getting legislation changed and involved. Mm-hmm. Um, so what do you think? And here we are again, right? So what do you think are the top three issues concerning black people? Top three issues. Number one is economics, right? If you don't got money, if you don't have a a way of having money flow within your community, you're going to struggle. So that's one. I think the second issue is our political engagement. Um, and, and I'm not talking about presidential elections because every time we talk about, every time we talk about political engagement, we talk about trying to get Trump out. No, I'm talking about, (laughs) (laughs) you can do that, but, but really the politics, the political focus has to be on the local level first, because that's, what's impacting your life more than Trump is. You might not like what Trump is saying, but there are people who are dictating where your kids go to school, how clean your water is, you know, when your streets get plowed, when your streets get cleaned up, when the potholes get resurfaced. All those things are really jeopard- are impacting your life on a, on a more direct level than what's happening on a national stage. And, and I don't think we think about that. You know, when I have the fortunate ability to live in the suburbs, all right? I moved to the, sur- the suburbs a couple of years ago because my wife wanted to be closer to her parents, and that's where they live. So I was like, all right, let's do this. But I'm, I'm a, I am grew up poor. I didn't get nothing. I was broke, food stamps, Section 8, WIC. That was my life for a long time. And what ended up happening was when I started living in the suburbs, I had to adjust 
I remember the me and my wife were talking about this recently. The first night we were at our place, she was like, Brandon, what's wrong with you? Because I had like anxiety. And I'm like, dude, it's super quiet and it's dark. Like I was, my body could not adjust to that environment. And I couldn't sleep for like a month until I eased in. And then when I go back into the community, because I'm there every day, because that's where I work and I do a lot of the work that I do, is a readjustment back to my norm, things that I'm comfortable with, hearing sirens, things of that nature. But what I've noticed is the difference in how politics impacts both communities. We had a really bad snowstorm last last winter, not this winter 2020, but winter 20, 2019 was really bad here in Minnesota. We had tons of snowstorms. We had below zero temperatures for like weeks. It was crazy. But we had this really bad snowstorm. And I remember waking up at six o'clock in the morning to go to work and all my streets were plowed and I was able to get to work fine. But then when I got to North Minneapolis, nothing was plowed. Nothing was plowed. And nothing was plowed when I left work that day either. Now, I drive an SUV because when you live in Minnesota, you got to have an SUV because the snow, I mean, we have pretty much like eight months of winter here. It's kind of crazy. But I can get through that because I have a, you know, I have four wheel drive, but there's a lot of people who can't because they can't afford that bigger vehicle, right? But the, why are those streets not plowed? And it's four o'clock. It's four thirty, it's five o'clock and the streets aren't plowed yet. Like, what is that about where my streets are cleared out at six o'clock in the morning. Why is that? Because the community here makes sure that that's a priority because they know I have to get to my job and I need those streets plowed. By the time I wake up and I get my kids on the bus or whatever, those streets need to be plowed. But the, the community organization in North Minneapolis doesn't focus on those things, but there are other issues as well. But I'm just giving an example between how politics and how that local politics can not impact your life. Same thing with like filling up potholes and things of that nature. There's streets that haven't been fixed in black neighborhoods for years where they'll get fixed like this in the neighborhood that I live in. And it's, again, those local politics are important. You know, school boards, um, parks and rec, streets, uh, sanitation, all those types of things are extremely important. Taxes, how tax dollars are done, policing, all that stuff is on a political level. So that's number two. Number three, and I'll make it quick, is education. Uh, we have to have better opportunities to cultivate our young. Uh, without doing that, our kid, our, we're going to continue to have intergenerational trauma over and over and over again. And we have to, and that deals with politics too, but education is important. Public school education is not good enough these days. You know this. You pay attention to tech. You know, we have little geniuses all throughout our community, but if they don't have the proper tools and the proper, proper guidance and access and opportunities, that genius doesn't go very far. And that's what I focus a lot of my attention on is helping young people get through their emotional and mental health and then utilize their genius for whatever they're trying to do. Because college might not be an opportunity for everybody, but guess what? College might not be relevant for anyone the way that the society is going. So why can't we have our youth prepared to do something much bigger and much better than what they're doing? So those are the three things for me. Yeah, I think all of those are important. Um, I like what you said about the political aspect, because I think when you go city versus suburb, and mm -hmm. it's like, what is what is more important? Like, what is priority, right? Right. Because I'm sure people in the city, they're, they're probably like, there's changes that need to be made regarding criminal right absolutely the criminal aspect whereas people are like hey like you said i need to get to work um we need to get the snow <laughs> when mm -hmm. i wake up at six o'clock i need a clear pathway so it's like the the difference of priorities between the two communities i think it makes it hard to kind of bridge that gap yeah um, sure among some you know among us within the black community Absolutely. And, and again, all three of those things interplay off of each other, right? Mm -hmm. So if you start working very effectively on one, it will have an indirect impact on the others. So when you talk about criminality, why do we have a lot of crimes? Because people don't have access to income. People, children don't wake up saying they want to be a criminal. All right. People, don't, that's not, people don't do that. You become, you do criminal behavior because of lack of opportunity and access to things because you feel like you have to. And then we have a culture that actually highlights a lot of the criminal activity as well. So once you get into it, it's supported. It's not look, it's not shamed. It's not looked down upon. It's just hustling. You just doing what you got to do to make money, right? But we we wouldn't have that if we had a better economic system. If we had better political systems um, within ourselves, and then if our educational system actually meant something to black students. 
we wouldn't have that level of criminality. Will we have disputes and will we have people who are on the fringes and do things? Sure, every community has that, but it will look a lot different for us. Do you think we have to continue protesting for each of these issues to get our points across? And I know protesting is just a small aspect of the work right. that you've done. Um, but like, like you said, if you go back four years ago in your city, there were right. protests after Castile. Mm-hmm. And you're like, okay, got something accomplished, you know, kind of left, put our foot off the gas. But fast forward, here we are again. Yeah, I do. I do think we need to continue to protest, but I don't think we need to continue to protest the same way. You know, standing outside of buildings and and yelling with signs is not going to effectively work every time. I think we need to start organizing on, like we talked about earlier, a political level and start pushing for change. We need to identify who our candidates are going to be in these local places and start supporting those people and make sure they have agendas that fit what we want. So if we want, let's say we're talking about better schools. So they need to have an educational agenda to advance the youth that are in school now to whatever they expect it to be after their term is over. So if it's a four-year plan, what does that look like and how do you plan on implementing that? That's a protest. We're not going to vote for anybody else but this candidate. You are utilizing your voice and your, and your actions to say, we're not doing this. Maybe we need to start protesting particular types of stores. We're not going to shop at this store anymore because you don't hire enough people look like this or you don't have enough you know, people of color or black folks or whoever on your board. So we don't support this store anymore. Our protest uh, tactics have to be shifted. They can't be the same as they are now because yelling don't, doesn't get anything done. Actions get things done. Yeah. I think like last week at work, it was really difficult for me. I mm-hmm. felt very... Um, emotionally conflicted um, with so many things. Um, because like yeah. you said, there's a lot of companies making statements regarding their stance mm-hmm. on the Black Lives Matter. And, you know, by Wednesday, I kind of felt like, okay, these are a bunch of followers. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like right. it was a trend. You know, unless you yeah. were very specific like Ben and Jerry's like okay right. you, like I wasn't I mean I eat their ice cream but I really wasn't looking for him right once they made their statement I'm like okay this is worth the wait right <laughs> right you know and it was yeah and and it was detailed yeah everybody else was just saying we're gonna do better we support you right and we're gonna donate a hundred thousand dollars to fight racial injustice like where does that hundred thousand dollars go Right. And as someone who works in nonprofit, a hundred thousand dollars doesn't go very far. Just FYI. <laughs> so, I mean, that's payroll. That's operations. <laughs> that's, that's barely payroll for two people to be completely yeah. honest. Yeah. If, you pay, if you're paying two people $45,000 a year, $50,000 a year, plus another 12 for their um, insurance and benefits, you ain't got, that's it. It's gone. So <laughs> for those who don't understand how that world works, but, but at least it's something, I don't want to make it seem like it ain't nothing. But to me, if you want to make effective change and you want to be about it and, you, and you're not just doing it because this is the new thing to do, just like everybody hopped on the COVID-19 train. When COVID-19 popped off in March, everybody was like, all right, we're COVID responding. We got custom ink. I'm, I'm just going to say brands. I don't care. Mm-hmm. Custom ink said, all right, we're making, we're, we, we have masks and now you can put your logos on them. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like, what? Now, that's kind of dope though because you know i'm all about branding i got my stuff on you know but i'm not gonna have a custom i'm not gonna have a mask with my logo on it that just seems i, I feel like i'm not helping anybody prevent COVID 19 i feel like i'm just promoting myself you know what i mean yeah. <laughs> it's just kind of crazy but we but this is what happens so if if these brands and these um companies really want to be about it and make change and they're really down with this diversity inclusion and equity space they need to be talking about, all right, we're adding or we're removing certain board positions to make sure we have, you know, 40% occupancy of our board represents BIPOC communities, mm-hmm. right? So now, now you're talking about for real, you know, for real diversity things, or we're going to say our management moving forward, our goal between now and 2023 is to make sure management and our companies represent 60% you know, black and trans, you know, they're going to throw everything together. So, you know, BIPOC communities. Okay. That, that to me shows that you're making efforts to do something, not just throwing, you know, your throwaway money into a fund to an organization you feel comfortable with, because a lot of times those dollars don't trickle down to the organizations that are doing that, that real work. It trickles down to those bigger organizations that, that already get money, but they have those networks and those relationships. But if they say, we're going to start throwing our conferences to attract more, you know, diverse perspectives in this tech sector, 
or we're going to do like that's when the change really happens because now you're building networks you're building structures that have these voices and these people involved and you're building opportunities but to me donating money doesn't um, i mean i just talked about this with my wife last night donating money does not solve the problem Mm. It might make it worse because now you say we gave all this money and nothing changed. So what are we supposed to do? All right. So, yeah, I think, um, I, I, I think white people don't know that. I think, I think we're kind of at a standstill because black people don't want to educate and white people don't know. <laughs> I, you know what? I think it's vice versa. You think so? Yeah, I, I, think, I think white people know, and black people don't want to be educated on it. But and I, I think white people also feel like money solves a lot of problems, so they're just yeah, yes. From their cultural paradigm, that's true though. Yeah, because if you're in a position of power, if you're in a position of superiority, chances are you have the structures in place for you to continue to have that power structure. Mm-hmm. So if I throw money your way, it does help you because it's just a tool for you to leverage your power. If you are at a position of being subjugated and you're in a subordinate position, money doesn't help you because you're not changing infrastructure. Does that make sense? Yeah. (laughs) That's like me saying, all right, I spanked my kid. Let's say I have a 15-year-old kid and I spanked my kid. Now, first of all, you shouldn't be spanking an adolescent. That ain't going to work anyway. But let's say I whip my kid and I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to give you $2,000 and you can just go buy whatever you want. You think my kid's going to learn a lesson? You think my kid's going to do anything different? They're going to be like, thanks, dad. Thanks for beating me and giving me a spanking. And I'm 15. You're crazy. Yeah. Like, thanks for this $2,000. I'm about to go to Apple and get this, you know, <laughs> this, this iPhone. I'm about to go get me some clothes. And I'm about, you know, I'm about to go ball out, whatever, right? You're going to just do whatever. You're probably going to be broke after you go to Apple. But <laughs> that's all another thing. But think about that. I'm in, a, I'm, in a, I'm in a position of power over my child. I hurt my child. But I'm saying I'm sorry, and I'm just going to give my child an absurd amount of money for a 15-year-old. What does that change for the child? Nothing. It changes nothing. They just get some stuff, and then they're back to the same position. But if I say, you know what, and this is some, this is some revolutionary parenting. I would never do this, by the way. But if I said, all right, I spanked you, and I'm sorry, and I'm going to tell you this. I'm never going to tell you what to ever do again <laughs> as your parent. I'm going to let you run the house so you can make all the decisions. I'm just here to pay the bills. People be like, what? Why would, why would a parent do that? Right. But, but in essence, that's what we're saying. We're saying that a, uh, from a superiority position, we need a, a change in how the dynamic is. And if you're not willing to give some share power or have some understanding or give access to people so they can build their own institutions or have their own political leverage, then you're not really solving the problem. You're just throwing money at it. But from that cultural paradigm, you can do that with them and they can make something happen. But when it comes to us, we need more than that because we have been systematically shut out of systems and shut out of opportunities for us to build and move forward. I talk to a lot of white people and some of them tell me they have a hard time finding qualified candidates. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're all over LinkedIn. If you look, I mean, I see a lot of qualified people. I don't know. You know, um, so, so, okay. But are the qualifications different? Right. Cause I'm like, Oh, Brandon. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, let's yeah. Bring, let's bring them in. And they're like, well, we're really looking for someone that has a master's in economics. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. So one, my answer to them when they say they can't find qualified candidates is, are you trying to cultivate any candidates? Because I know a lot of organizations, foundations that do fellowship programs. They have all different type of apprenticeships. People who start to actually make the type of employees they want. If they're really about it, they need to start doing that. You know, where is the tech fellowship program that's helping to rebuild and move forward whatever sectors in tech or whatever the case may be? That can be done and it doesn't take long. You can do a six months fellowship, Mm -hmm. give somebody $10,000 for six months to be something in your company. That makes you look good. You could probably get that money donated from from other funders. And, and then you have the type of employee you want. So if you can't find somebody, what are you doing to make sure you get the type of person you want? Yeah. And then you can hire every type of person you want. You can say, all right, we want, we want somebody from the LGBTQ plus community. We want a native. We want somebody who's, you know, English is a second or third language. We want a black person. We want a whatever, right? You can say, we got this cohort. 
We brought in these eight different people who represent these eight different communities. We gave them all $30,000 and they're going to do a year fellowship here at this company. That makes a company look good. Yeah. It's a win, win, win all the way around. And I think that can be applied to the nonprofit sector. You know, we talked oh, about four seats and um, I believe Alexis Ohan, um, Serena's mm-hmm. husband who stepped out from the Reddit board, which I think mm-hmm. is going to be interesting to see how Reddit, you know, moves forward as well as him. Um, Cause I, I definitely have an idea that he has a bigger plan ahead. Absolutely. Just the way with that couple moves. But um, I, I think that's the problem. I kind of feel like um, white people have the opportunity to be groomed, you know, whether it's from high school, college, entry level positions, whereas black people were expected to come ready made. And it's like, we're already having a hard yes. time navigating these white spaces be it a PWI, corporate America. And, you know, and just this weekend, I'm like, you know, yes, it's hard to navigate these white spaces, but everywhere is a white space. Like I was really struggling to get through work this week. And it's just like the microaggressions continue to build. Fortunately, I had already took Friday off. So by Thursday Mm -hmm. at three Mm o'clock, It's like, look, mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm out of here. Like, Check I'm, it out. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, but and that was just at work. But with me also having an association, the number of emails, right. phone calls I got. Yep. I was like, oh, we've been meaning to. And I'm, and I'm like, granted, I have a new association. So there's a lot of grace with that. Right. But um, like, I just wasn't able to turn off this past week up until Friday um, mm. because there was just so many questions from our white counterparts. Yeah. I mean, I, I <laughs> as we speak now, I have my email pulled up um, and I have several, you know, flag emails from white folks who are asking me for help with things. And I'm just like, I'll get to you when I get to you. Mm-hmm. I do a, I do a training called um, moving beyond cultural competence to cultural intelligence, where I talk about this mainly with a lot of white folks, but I talk about how do we start, Stop saying we're culturally competent and start making it look like an action. What does it look like on a day-to-day and how do you do that? And when I do this training, the feedback that I get from white folks is like they never heard any of this or they didn't know that they could do this. And I'm like, yes, I shouldn't have to give you permission for you to stop being um, oppressive and to get rid of your superiority complex and see people for who they are and just work from them there. Um, and, I, and I do the training very deliberate and strategic because I use myself as an example, as a black man, because, you know, I come in, they already think that, oh, well, you know, he's from a community where he's oppressed. So he must not have to be culturally competent because he knows it all. And I'm like, no, I've had my struggles. So I use a specific example of a community that I had to go into and how I had to rework my own mentality and my own bias in that community to give a better service delivery. Um, and when I'm able to do that and then they're able to see me as an example, then they start to click and get it a little bit. But I also hold them accountable for dealing with their own stuff because none of this stuff that we're talking about works until they deal with their own stuff. And one of the things that is important for white folks to know is that they have stuff too. They have been cultivated into their own culture that they are the standard. So they think that anything that happens to them isn't impactful and they see themselves as other and they're not as other when it comes to this. They have stuff just as bad as anybody else and they don't understand that. Until you point it out to them and say, no, y'all messed up too. And it ain't just about people of color. It's about you being messed up. And you need to get your stuff together. And you hold trauma in your body just like everybody else does. My trauma is different because of you, but you're, you're, the reason why I have trauma because of you is because of your trauma. Yeah, and it's just and your cycle. issues. Yeah. It, exactly. And until they're ready to break their cycle, we're going to keep spinning because we have developed a culture. I'm talking about black folks now. We have developed a culture responding to white supremacy and racism. We literally used to call black culture the struggle. Mm. Like, yeah. <laughs> like that, that's how we've been cultivated is always responding to what white people do to us. What I try to do is help us move forward as best as possible so that we're not responding to anybody but ourselves and whatever they do. Yes, it's going to be impactful to us, but at least we're moving towards something that doesn't have this detrimental effect to our community. That's powerful. That's powerful. Um, So you do believe we can have social cohesiveness? I can't even speak. Cohesiveness? (laughs) I got you. Um, I don't know what that looks like. I need to define it. 
Uh, I do think that there's a ideal that that could be, that could happen, but there's going to have to be some revolutionary change from everybody. You know, as black people, we deal with anti-blackness from everybody, even ourselves. Right. So, you know, we got uh, Indian folks from India or Southeast Asian folks, however you want to term them. They don't like black folks. We got Africans who come to America that they don't like black folks. And you know about this because you know your family. <laughs> yeah. They don't like American black folks. We got American black folks that don't like each other. We got the white folks. And then we got Latinos who, you know, got a lot of African ancestry, but they don't want to be black. Like, the anti-blackness has to go. I don't know if it can, but at least inside of us as black Americans, if we can undo a lot of our own anti-blackness, that's going to help us with our own cohesion. Because if we don't deal with that, we're always going to see ourselves as less than, and we're always going to expect nothing or little bits of something. And then we're always going to be in this position where we're overwhelmed and overstressed and we have to check the way we wear our hair and we got to deal with all these microaggressions. It's because a lot of that is, how we have just taken what other people have put upon us and accepted it. So I don't, I don't want to care about how other people feel about me, but I do because I'm a black man and I care about my daughters. My oldest daughter, her name is Zanella. You think she's not going to have problems growing up? Absolutely. But I still decided we're going to name her this because that's the name we like and that's the name we chose. And people are going to have to learn how to say her name. And I have to install pride in my daughter for her to check people in a respectful way, but let them know this is how you say my name. Just like we say other things. We have to learn how to say all types of stuff. People can learn how to say your name and you don't have to feel shame because of what your name is. No, but but this is the stuff that black people have to deal with because we have been pushed upon anti-blackness upon us through racism and white supremacy and everybody else has just jumped on it and we have accepted it. But until we start dealing with our own internal issues, it doesn't matter what everybody else does because it's going to continue. So racial cohesion can happen but under whose guidance? Is it going to be under white supremacy? Because that might not be good. Is it going to be under Chinese supremacy? Because if we're talking about who's dominant, the Chinese got the economic sector on lock. And I don't think it's going to be let go anytime soon. And I don't think I, we talk about white supremacy. I don't think we want no Chinese supremacy. That's a whole nother, <laughs> that's a whole nother type of oppression that we don't want because they will kill you for real, for real. Like <laughs> they don't want you they'll get you out of here. But no, I'm just, if you look at Chinese politics, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> they run people out. <laughs> they build cities to push people to them cities. They don't, oh that's, all they, that's how Chinese people run. So at the end of the day, if we don't start dealing with our stuff, we will, the way that this world has been set up, I don't know if this is human nature or this is just a ramification of capitalism, but there's always going to be this hierarchy. And we have to make sure no matter where we're at on this hierarchy, we're protecting ourselves. We have to stop infighting as best as possible because we cannot compete with anybody if we're co constantly competing with ourselves. Absolutely. I agree with that. I like the motivation you give your daughter regarding her name. Um, how mm -hmm. important is the black man and the black family unit regarding this movement? Uh, it's extremely important. Um, we can't have any movements without strong family structures. Otherwise you have a bunch of individuals who have their own ideals, who are just running off, trying to do whatever is best for them. Um, black men are essential in this movement because we are, unfortunately, the, we, we are the tar we're the cannon fire. We're the targets of this, of this mm -hmm. movement, unfortunately. Even though a lot of the organizing doesn't always happen with us, we are the ones who get the, the fire lit for these things to happen. You know, yes, there are black, Breonna Taylor, there are black women who are victims of the same oppressive symptoms or system as everybody else, but it's typically black men who for some reason get this emotional charge and built up. Not saying that's right or wrong, I'm just saying what it is. Black men are important to be in this, in this, in this mission and in this whole movement because without strong men, you cannot change environments. This is a historical fact. There's no, this is not a Black Panther movie, all right? There's no collective of women that have shifted the environment like a collective of men do. Women are there to be a part of the collective and make things happen. Like the civil rights movement probably wouldn't have been as effective without the strong element of women. However, men are usually the people who shift environments. And without black men working collectively together and then in tandem with black women, the movement is not going to be as impactful as, as we would like it to be. I know I'm going to get a lot of negative feedback from saying that because what it sounds like I'm saying is black women can't move things forward. It's not what I'm saying. We need our men to be a part. We need our men to compete with other men. 
every other ethnic group has men that come together and compete against other men. Even on the continent of Africa, you have Nigerian men who work together to get things done. Only black men are the only men who don't come together to work collectively on anything outside of a sports arena. Like, think about that. Yeah. Yeah. We are, everything else, black men, we, we might do it. Sports and fraternities, a little bit for fraternities. I give fraternities a little bit of credit, even though I'm not, I'm not a frat bro on no level. But those are the only two arenas where you'll see black men really, like, come together to push forward on something is in sports or on a, in a frat. And even those things get a little ch- chippy and a little interesting as well. <clears throat> but we have to be able to come together on a political level to move things forward. You talked about the black family. The black family is important because families are what build communities. You cannot have a, a healthy community without healthy families. And we need one, we need black male men and black women to work collaboratively together in a healthy way, whether we're in relationships with them or not doesn't matter we need both areas to work in a in a um constructive manner together we need to be focusing on cultivating our children with healthy adults and role models all right i say adults and role models because when we say healthy adults people want to think parents no sometimes you don't have to be a parent to help a young person sometimes you're a healthy coach you're a healthy teacher you might be a healthy neighbor you might be just somebody who just does mentoring once a month, but we need healthy models for our kids because they just don't get enough of it. Unfortunately, they don't get enough healthy models. They get a lot of unhealthy models. They don't get enough healthy models. So if you're a black person who's constructive and you're doing something good, let some young people see you do those good things you do. It goes a long, long way, especially if you're a black man, because the narrative of black men is that we do not help our communities, we destroy them. And when black kids can see a black man come in and help them and not try to have sex with their mama, not try to have sex with them, that goes a long way. And I'm not, I'm, I'm saying that because this is the feedback. I have young people that I've been working with like 10 years ago, come back today and say, Brand, I want to thank you for being the first man that ever helped me and didn't try to have sex with me. And this, this girl, this young lady who said this to me was a couple months ago. And when I was helping her, she was like 14 years old. She's 24 now. Wow. She's like, you're the first man wow. that I know who helped me that did not try to have sex with me. What? Exactly. Are you kidding me? You're 14 when I was helping you. But, that, but that's what ends up happening is we have so many young people who have these non-constructive models and these non-constructive adults in their life, they start to lose hope in themselves. And we need, so we need that constructive engagement between male and female, no matter what your sexual orientation or gender expression is, it doesn't matter. We have to work effectively. You cannot allow those things and how people live their lives to start breaking down the responsibility you have to your community. So I hope I answered your question. No, you did. Um, I love what you said. I love everything that you said, because I actually think that is what is hurting our community. You know, people are saying the black woman needs to be protected, but I feel like the black man only, if and only protects the black woman, if he's in relationship with her, right. Or it's his mom or family member. And I'm, my thing is the black man needs to protect the black woman. That's in right standing. Right. This isn't about us having an intimate relationship. This is about you supporting me, and it has to be reciprocated, right? Us supporting right. each other, whether it's in the boardroom, if they're like, okay, we have this opening, who can fill this position? Say mm-hmm. my name, nominate mm-hmm. me. If you think I'm qualified, bring me up, right? Mm-hmm. Um, this is if I'm leaving the store and I'm getting harassed by another man, step in. You know, Mm -hmm. like, hey, leave the sister alone. And I think it's even those, to me, very minimum items, even leading up to politics, are important. And I do think we need more Black men um, stepping up and supporting our sisters, protecting us in the right way. And of course, you know, leaving the sexual aspect of it, because I do think that's what's crippling us. Right. Yeah. And that's loaded. That's a whole nother podcast, which you just yeah. stated because I got <laughs> several answers, but you're right. And I would say we, we need to support each other because in the world that I navigate in, the nonprofit and government world, there's a lot more black women than black men present. And those black women should be supporting those black men as well when the opportunity is there. If they have that leverage and they have that influence in those sectors, then they should be supporting black men as well. We just have to be healthy and support each other no matter how we identify. And we just don't do it. You know, black women support black women like no other. I mean, they, the organization's crazy. 
you know this. I've seen the organization you started down there in Houston. All them bloggers and all those people was black women. I'm like, damn, they getting it cracking down there. But but it wasn't a bad thing. I wasn't hating on it. But I noticed it was like, okay, this is. I, I forgot even what the organization was called, but I remember y'all's logo. It was really nice. But it was a bunch of sisters, and y'all organized. Y'all got that started, and that was great. That's what happens a lot all over the community is black women. They've learned how to come together and develop something together. Black men have not learned how to do that. Mm. When we learn how to do that together, then we're going to start to see a lot of differences because our kids are going to see something different. And then they're not going to be fighting and arguing about nothing amongst each other. They're going to just keep moving forward. Right. And that's what we need. But we've been conditioned as black folks to always fight each other. Males and females fight each other. Female and female, even though y'all organize well, y'all can fight real quick. Y'all can organize and then be like, oh, she thinks she all that. Why she the president? And yada, yada, yada. That stuff, ha- we are so toxic on that level of our culture that we can't move forward because we keep infighting. I call that anti-blackness. Once you have a value and a moral code and respect for blackness, you will let some of that stuff go or it doesn't even show up. But when you when you have this kind of adversity towards black people and black people can't get nothing done and black people can't do that, then that's what breeds that opportunity for our organizations not to not to flourish. And then they just kind of flounder and they fall off because we are always battling with ourselves. So yeah, we need to fight white supremacy, but what's what good is it if you only got two people down with you and everybody else is fighting? Ah, so much. Yeah, I see so, you smiling. So you must have had some experiences in the last couple of years. Yeah, <laughs> with some of this. Yeah, but yeah. it's real. It's it's a lot, and I think I mean I think anyone that starts a nonprofit means well. Yeah, like you can you figure out your limitations very quickly. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, and that's why you need a board, and you need people that ha- are good in at least one thing mm-hmm. for a non. This is one of the reasons why I went from to an LLC and not a nonprofit is because I'm not ready to develop a team like that yet. Like, I don't, I don't know enough people to really make my nonprofit go to the level it needs to go. I had to continue to build my network, which is, I credit you for helping me understand how to build networks, right? I had to keep building my network so when I can identify, okay, boom, I got my person who's good with funding and fundraising. Mm. Boom, I got my person who's good with personnel. Boom, I got my person who's good with marketing. I got my person who's a part of all the association and these other boards. That's what you can do. But people, they just want to help. So they go, they start a nonprofit and then they get mad. They don't get no funding. But it's like, look who you got around you. You don't got the people you need. So just do an LLC, do your own thing, make your little money on the side with your contracts until you're ready to build your team. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, like, I, yep. <laughs> I hope y'all are writing, writing notes. <laughs> But it's it's the truth. I see now. I see black folks who say, All right, "Yeah, I'm the CEO of X, Y, and Z," and I'm like, "What was your? T-? It's just them. You ain't the CEO. If it's just you, you are not a CEO. <laughs> you are an independent person." <laughs> Don't get me started. You know, entrepreneurship sounds sexy. So <laughs> I'm like, hold on. But I mean, look, entrepreneurship is hard. Corporate America is hard. Um, I don't think enough talk is centered around that. And you just gotta kind of pick your struggle, you know, and just keep pushing um, because both of them are rewarding in its own right. Absolutely. So. And we should be building not, I mean, this, if there's no other time to start a, you know, a LLC or nonprofit or S corp or whatever is right now. There's so much confusion. There's so much disruption in our society. These are, these are the times that are going to make people wealthy or it's going to start you on that path to getting wealthy because nobody knows what the hell is going on all we know is zoom blew up i can't go to the store somebody want me to wear a mask i can't find hand sanitizer nowhere these are the opportunities for you to figure out okay my job said i can work from home i know i ain't working 40 hours at home i manage i manage i got 15 staff members I know they ain't doing 40 hours a week. I know this. <laughs> I am because I'm manager. I got to do all this stuff. But I know they're not. And what did I tell my staff? I said, look, I don't know what's going to happen next. But if you got an idea, this is your opportunity to work on it and still get paid. Now, I ain't supposed to say that but because I'm their manager. But look, you got to take care of your kids. You got to be the teacher now for your children. If Most of my staff have children. You got to be the teacher, but those extra hours you have, because we're not doing service delivery like we used to, 
think about how you're going to leverage your talents and skills because I'm about transparency and development with my staff, just like I am with any clients I work with. I'm going to keep it real with you as your therapist. If you mess up, I'm going to let you know. That was your fault. That ain't their fault. I see. I, I understand why you feel that way, but that was you. And how are we going to move forward? How are we going to develop from that? If you're somebody who's stuck and you got this idle time on your hand, maybe you don't have any kids, which is great. At the moment, you need to be thinking about how am I going to leverage this opportunity? Everything's online. There's more information than you need online for you to get started. Figure out something. You might just start making homemade hand sanitizer. That sounds silly, but you could have made a couple thousand dollars in a couple weeks because can't nobody find none of this stuff. Or an alternative to hand sanitizer, right? Or you might... One of the ideas I had was, first of all, I got a hair, I need to go get my haircut again, but the barbershops finally started to open back up, right? And I was like, man, if I had the courage to cut my own hair, I wouldn't have no worries. You can, if you are a barber or you're a beautician and you know how to cut your own hair, you could have been making YouTube tutorials and blew up. If you are a sister who knows how to do her own hair and you just make a tutorial, you just put on Instagram every day on Instagram, you're doing a new technique. You could have so many subscribers, so many followers, right? But we don't think about these things. We got a lot of natural genius within ourselves that we don't unleash because we feel like we have to get permission from somebody. And a lot of times there's somebody's a white person, but that's a whole nother mm. podcast mm. episode. Come on, you, man. Have, <laughs> you have the opportunity to do a lot of things and you have a lot. It's a different time now because the internet is it's it's level it's making the playing fields more level it's not leveling the playing field but it's making the opportunities there take them if you are somebody who knows how to do something right now right now let's just talk about white folks here's a business opportunity for somebody right now you know right now there are a lot of white people who got white guilt they're they're inboxing you they're inboxing me that's a business right there you let me the, the the white guilt handbook. You can make a 10-page PDF and sell that damn thing for $30 right now and probably sell 100 copies of it. You uh, laughing? I'm I might try. do that. It's Sunday. I'm, I might get that done this week. I might have to wait. This, this episode ain't going to go out this week. Hold on. We're going to hold this episode. <laughs> the white guilt handbook. How to, how to deal with your whiteness and get your life together. My sister girl so-and-so. Hello? I mean, you can do that on your cell phone. You can auto detect a 30 page audio book telling white people how to get over their stuff. And next thing you know, you sit next to, you know, um, what's her name? Mel Robbins. And you on you, you doing all these stuff because you telling white folks how to get their stuff together. You laughing, but you know, I'm telling the truth. You I know. never know. I know. <laughs> I know they're out there. And it's funny because prior to the pandemic, I was working on inclusion marketing. And that idea stemmed from the association because white talent acquisition managers will contact me like, Mm -hmm. oh, my God, you know, we're big on diversity inclusion. We need marketers. Yep. You know, and um, and I'm like, hey, how would you find us? Hey, let's get on the phone and chat. And I keep hearing the same problem over and over again. I already have my LLC. I just need to change my business model a little bit. Mm-hmm. And now I'm just I'm just gathering information and now I'm going to start consulting. So And how much time do you think that took you to do that? Which part? Changing, pivoting in my business? The whole thing from from recognizing that there was a problem mm-hmm. to doing your reaction to now you're offering a solution. I would say I would say like less than 30 days, right? Because people were reaching out to me <laughs> Yep. And it's like, oh, okay, you know, cause, but when, when the Gap reached out to me, I was like, mm-hmm. oh. Oh, this, yeah. <laughs> let, let me go ahead and legal up. Let me, <laughs> let me get, let me get these contracts looked over. Yeah. Yeah. But look at that. Less than 30 days. Yeah. And I was, I mean, I was fortunate because I already had other things in place, but I think that name, right, that name, that branding recognition put validation versus yep. some of these agencies and I'm like, okay, you're in Iowa. Like, of course yep. you need help. But it's like the gap. Oh. Yep. Yeah. And then they're initiating, like, hey, I would love to yeah. like, yeah. okay, I'm ready. Let's go. Yep. So, and and if you ain't ready for the opportunities, you get ready because they're right. they're here. They're here. Right. 
we have to we have to be again using our melanated genius. I say this all the time. Use your melanated genius. You have to go ahead and leverage the opportunities that are in front of you. And this is an opportunity. You know, I created a course called Cultivating Calm During Times of Uncertainty. It's a $1 course. I'm selling it on Gumroad. You can go to my website and check it out. That course did well. For $1, I, I, I did pretty well with that course. <laughs> I'm not going to say what I did. did the price no, it's still, no, it's still a dollar. It's, still, it's there for you. Wow. It's still a dollar. But it sold pretty well. That's generous. Yes. Um, the time is now. You know, the time is now. And I think the biggest thing is we have to keep pushing. You know, as we go into this new week, um, as we go into 2021, um, mm-hmm. or I, I should say into the election, after the election, into 2021, we have to keep pushing. And I think that's the biggest thing. And I know we have like, different ways of pushing. Um, I know some of the white people are already tired. It's like, we've been tired. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, yep. Mm-hmm. You know, welcome you know, to the party. <laughs> this welcome, welcome to the sleepover. <laughs> Wait, this is you might not come to the cookout, but you can come to the sleepover because we tired. So. <laughs> I was like, this, this is the only week one. What, what you talking about? <laughs> <clears throat> but yeah, we definitely have to keep that same energy um, in all aspects, you know, whether it's protesting, politics, legislation, businesses. Uh, we just have to keep pushing and moving this agenda forward because we have something and we are resilient and powerful people yeah absolutely i know we covered a lot what am i missing anything um how can people find you yeah i don't you know the only thing i want to let leave on is a statement that i make is kind of a quote is live your life with purpose on purpose there's no better time to do that Uh, if you are a black person listening to this you know you have you have the permission you have the validation to be who you are, no matter how you are, and be able, be ready to evolve. If you're a person of color, who, a non-black person, but a person of color, this is your opportunity to look at yourself and figure out what kind of harm has been done and what kind of harm have you done and how can you move forward too? Because, you know, we talk a lot about white supremacy and racism, but there are other folks who are very anti-black as well. And that has to be, you have to be honest about that and figure out where do you fit in this equation? <clears throat> and then for white folks, You know, yeah, it might be guilt. You might feel bad. You might want to help, but you have to do an internal investigation of yourself too. And how are you contributing to some of these, um, you know, disparities and inequities? And if you are not contributing to them, who around you are? Because a lot of white folks are in circles and in networks that other people are not, and they don't even realize it. And then those those circles and those networks are influential to other people's lives, and you don't even realize it. So be, you know, don't just, you know, ask people, don't tell people that you feel sorry for what happened, like you're just different from them, and you don't have the same level of grief. You should. And if you don't, that's something for you to think about, is you should care just about George Floyd's life like anybody else's. And if you don't, that's something that you need to self-evaluate with yourself. Um, for folks who want to get, you know, you know, connect with me, you can go to jegna.org. That's J-E-G-N-A dot org. Uh, you can find the course that I talked about, Cultivating Calm During Times of Uncertainty. I made that video. It's a video series for folks who are struggling during this COVID-19 um, space that we're in. Uh, I have YouTube channel as well. You can just type in Brandon Jones Jegna or you can go to my website to get access to it where I share a lot of content around emotional and mental health and just how to move forward, personal development. Um, you know, I have audio books. I have a lot of good stuff. Just check it out. If you have any questions for me or if you feel like I might be able to help you with any trains or anything, feel free to go to my website and just connect with me there. Um, yeah, that's me in a nutshell. You connect with me on social media. I'm by Brandon Jones on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. That's by Brandon Jones. I love it. I love it. We'll definitely have those links in the show notes. And yeah, as always, Brandon, thanks for everything. I appreciate it. Absolutely. And thank you. I hope you enjoyed that episode with Brandon Jones. Please um, show some love to him on social media. Check out his material. I think as a Black male therapist, he is so important to our community, right? Because there's not a lot of black therapists and then there's not a lot of black male therapists. So I want to encourage, especially our men that are listening to the show. If you need someone to talk to, um, please reach out to him. And, you know, if he's not available, I'm pretty sure he can reach out to someone else. And I know 
another black male therapist. Um, I know it's hard to come across the idea of therapy <laughs> to begin with, and then to take the time to actually find someone. You can even say it's similar to dating. And just because you go to the first therapist you see doesn't mean you have to stay with them. You know, it's a process. It's, it's dating. It's a job interview. Things need to be reciprocated. Um, people need to show up for you. They need a whole space for you. They need to be valuable and it needs to be reciprocated. Right. So please be mindful of that. Um, I'm just so grateful, so grateful to uh, start this, <laughs> to get this out of the way. Uh, I want you to be encouraged. I want you to be blessed. Remember, I believe in you and a personal connection leads to an influential network. Thanks for networking with Michelle. Michelle.